Um, uh, moving on at the end of 1999, uh, started my own hedge fund. Now, just to let you know uh, uh, about uh, Sunkiss, the portfolio was um, about 215 million when I started. It was over 300 million when I left. So uh, we had some nice growth in that uh, portfolio before I uh, before I managed to leave. Um, I'm a contributor to the street.com, realmoney.com. Uh, work closely with some partners like Mark and Shaken Analytics uh, on webinars and other things as well, too. Uh, some of you have seen my charts featured prominently on Jim Cramer's Mad Money Show, the off the charts, off the charts segment. Also co-manage a product with, uh, with Christopher Sace on the, uh, uh, the street.com side called Trifecta Stocks. I have a tra chat room. That I'm in every every day filled with traders, uh, grid analysis, flow, uh, actionable ideas. And if you were going to nail me and saying, you know, hey Bob, what is it you really feel like you're an expert on? I'd say probably technical analysis and the psychology of trading. Um, I don't have a degree in psychology. I have a degree in finance. I have an MBA as well too. But I've learned through through periods of time about the importance of the mental game on trading. So. Um, that's uh, probably where I'm at. So let's take a look at um, some of the slides over here. Started explosive options in 2011. It's uh, long and short calls, uh, long and short calls and puts. Um, I have a new book coming out. I'll talk with you a little bit about that shortly. So let's get into, let's dive in here and talk about. It. So um, section one, listening to the markets, how to turn down the noise and create how it creates fear and volatility. So around us we always have lots of distractions right and they're all around us maybe they're family issues maybe uh, phone calls text messages somebody needs something you have to step out you have a doctor's appointment you have ailments and so forth we have to keep those things under control if we want to be successful in trading because we really don't know when something is going to hit for us that we need to take advantage of those windows of opportunities are small they're narrow they're they're short but they're very sweet if we're ready and, and uh, for them when they come across to us. So some of the media influences as well um, are out there and we have to be careful how we manage our time and manage what we, uh, what we see and what we hear and get influenced on. Now, um, I'm a little bit biased to CNBC. I have that on quite a bit, um, but when, when it's all noise, I do turn it down. However, like many of you, uh, a couple of days ago on Monday, um, I was watching it, paying very much attention to it because um, Mark was on the show on Squawk Box. He did a great job, by the way, talking with Joe and, and Becky on the uh, on the show right, right in front of uh, ringing the opening bell for the NASDAQ. So congratulations to you, Mark. That was a great day for you, great moment for you to do that. But, uh, you were fantastic. Oh, thank you, Bob. You were terrific on the show. Um, Bloomberg, Fox Business, all these things, they, they tend to want to keep you gripped to watching their shows. And um, I'm not going to say anything about um, fake news, but certainly there's always some times where um, the news and the the, uh, the things that are being presented in the media are not anything you need to be paying attention to. We really need to be paying attention more to the price action and what is happening in the markets. There's radio shows out there. Social media also has a tendency now to give out um, influential, influential data and information that we just need to turn off from time to time. Because the common goal is just to get ratings. It just gets your interest, right, and, and distract you. They get their best ratings when, when, when markets are down, right? When, when do we have a markets in turmoil in CNBC? When the, when the, when the, when the Dow or the Industrials is down 1,000 points like it was in February. We had a couple of those uh, during that one week in, uh, in February, and all of a sudden CNBC says it's time for a markets and turmoil special. People are confused in these times, and they, they, they're worried, and they're concerned, they're nervous, and they want to know where to get the right answers. So social media as well, too. Slick marketing, quick words, attract many carers, passers by. Um, and while, you know, what, there is a lot of good stuff out there, a, good, a lot of good content out there to, to listen to, um, you do have to really be careful on how much uh, you rely on all that free stuff that's uh, put out on social media. And how about some of those analysts uh, and experts that, that are out there um, talking their book out there on uh, on CNBC or, or, or Bloomberg or whatever? 
these experts and pundits are always spinning it in a way that is advantageous, advantageous to them. If they don't care about you and don't care about your money. The people who really care about you are the ones who provide you good, solid, objective information and data. Not unlike Chicken Analytics, which actually just puts out stuff that is uh, objective, uh, just the real numbers, and lets you decide whether something is going to go up or down. Not anybody else's influence. That spin cycle that we talk about with the media has been really present uh, the last couple of uh, last couple of months. We get we get tweets from uh, President Trump. We get uh, stuff coming out from from him and others about trade, about China, about North Korea, whatever. Uh, the media will tell you more false notions than you would ever expect. And again, it's just about spin and it's just about trying to create some some hoopla to get you interested. And those again, those are just True distractions. Fast markets require very, very quick thinking. And then we have understanding a uh, spin from abroad. We get a lot of this stuff. Remember back in the day when we, uh, some years ago, where we were talking, where it was all Greece, Greece, and nothing but Greece, and talking about how um, they're about ready to go bankrupt and it was disrupting a lot of the uh, uh, functional markets that are that are in Europe or pop potentially going to do that. And of course, all that stuff was. Um, uh, not all by the way, went by the wayside when nothing really uh, occurred from that as it normally doesn't. Um, but that spin can confuse you, right? And when you're confused, you tend to have a little bit of fear and you end up, end up making the wrong move and probably selling far sooner or far earlier than you probably should have. Um, that total confusion and chaos, again, I, I, I cite Greece and, and Europe on those uh, three, uh, three times, 2010, 11, and 15, um, probably put more people on the sidelines for the wrong reason. So um, I constantly talk about this uh, a lot, especially uh, in some of my articles that I write. And I think um, as a trend follower, my friend Dave Landry, who calls himself the trend following moron, he's one of my mentors, the guys, uh, kind of one of the guys who I, I started uh, following many, many years ago. Uh, I'm a trend follower as well, too. And I think trying to guess tops and bottoms is really a fool's game, you know? So so sure, I mean, I, I know some people out there today on, on Twitter were, were, argue, were, were trying to convince me that we've hit the bottom, uh, 2591 on the futures. We came down there really, really sharply in the first um, hour, hour and a half of, of, of the market day today. Uh, came and nearly tested that bottom, and we and we we rallied off of that. Okay, good. Forty handles off that low. Great, fantastic. Okay. Um, if you're a day trader, you trade futures. Wonderful. If you caught that bottom and you and you got out at the top today, beautiful. I love it. That's not my game, and I think that um, by and large, the big money is made by trading trends, by getting involved in trending moves, and not uh, fast moves like that. So while we have seen many people try to call tops and try to call bottoms over um, certainly over the last couple of months. Um, I, I did hear some people talking about how uh, January's high was the top for the year. My, my gosh, I look at the calendar. What, Mark, what day is it today? Mark, March, May, May 3rd, right? I, as far as my calendar looks, I, I, we have about seven more months to go. That's kind of a, uh, that, if somebody's calling a top from January 29th, that's quite a, that's quite a bold statement, wouldn't you say? For somebody to um, to call that top um, without knowing all the information that is out there is, um, I don't know, kind of foolish to me. But, you know, you never know. And I know Mark, Mark has talked uh, recently uh, about he's looking for a range of, to the end of the year of about 2,800 to 3,000. Um, of course, we could be slipping a little bit lower from here before then, but still 2,800 to 3,000 would put you well above the all-time high, which is about 2,872, especially if we get the high end of the of that range that Mark was talking about. So what I prefer to do is, is basically um, let the markets tell me what to do. The market will always tell you the truth. Hedge fund managers, these pundits, experts, so forth in the media, they give their opinions. They they do not make money 
consistently with their opinions. They're out there hawking their book or something like that. The markets will always tell you the truth about what to do. So, um, well, we've, we've sort of, I, I say, I ask, ask this question facetiously. It says, you know, are, will we, will we be in a correction? I guess we're sort of in a correction right now, right? We're, we're within a, a, a 10% down move and uh, we keep bouncing down or hitting that 200 day moving average, bouncing off to, you know, four, five, six, seven times already. We've been in one, right? And they don't, but they, uh, but generally corrections don't occur in such a late stage cycle of, of, of the market. So maybe that's when bear markets arrive. We were nine years into this rally. And it's obviously a lot longer than people would have thought or would have expected. And probably the reason for that is because of all the quantitative easing that we had over the years and the easy money. And the easy money policy is pretty much going away now, right? We have the Fed involved in raising interest rates. And that's generally speaking, um, they're, take, they're, they're pulling the accommodation that's been there for many, many years. I think even if we get up to 3% on the Fed funds rate, we're still in accommodative mode. But that we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that at, a, at, another, at another time. So, <clears throat> um, so we don't really have um, a problem with corrections here. It's just we haven't had one for such a, for, for such a long time. I think really the last big correction we had, um, Mark, was probably in um, – Early, 2000, early 2016, we had a big giant uh, slice down in January and early February. I think we were down about 12, 13%, something like that, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and then prior to that, it was 15. So it's been a while since we really had a, a good size correction. And, and I think that was one of the things that we would hear in the media, much like in, uh, on CNBC and, and, and elsewhere, that there was a problem with that. I think, I think there's some normality that the media wants to have happen in the market. So um, in other words, so there's got to be a 10% correction. And, and if we're in a bear market, it's got to be 20%. Things that fit neatly in a box. I don't particularly agree that, with that. And I don't, because markets are dynamic, things happen. Um, news happens and it tends to, uh, to move markets in different directions. Uh, and let's not forget the market is there to make everybody feel the, 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 the most pain and make everybody look the most stupid, right? Bulls and bears. So generally speaking, corrections, and, and I know Mark talked about this um, in our webinar uh, not too long ago, and he talked about this uh, uh, in one of his uh, reports the other day. Uh, corrections last a couple of months. They're generally speaking, um, 10, 12, 13%. Uh, we're, I think we're about three months into this thing now. We maybe have another month to go. But they're mostly done to exhaust you mentally. Raise your hand, how many of you people are exhausted mentally? Type in there yes or no. I bet most of you are. I'm pretty, I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty exhausted myself at the end of each and every day. Um, currently right now, we have more than 50% stocks that are down 20% or more. That leadership that we've, been, we've had for such a long time, like the semiconductor stocks, um, has been slipping. The financials have been poor at best. Uh, some of the industrials are, have been have been improving a little bit, but not so much. We've had uh, strong earnings from energy stocks. The energies have been leading as crude oil has been doing extremely well. It's up near seventy dollars a barrel on the WTI. So the, some of those names have been have been uh, outperforming. So it's been hit and miss, right? But when you look at stocks in the defense sector, which has been really rocketing since early 2017, the, those stocks have gotten uh, pasted for the past couple of uh, couple of weeks. Northrop Grumman, although it was up today, Lockheed Martin was up today. It was down about 50 bucks for uh, for for a while, from 360 all the way down to 300 earlier today. So down almost 20, 20 more than almost 20 percent um, in about 10 sessions. So. That's some serious selling going on here. We have to really be aware of that, um, especially when the leadership is uh, is starting to uh, starting to slip. So what happened in January? Well, we had volatility pretty much um, stayed low for the better part of the month, and then start it started to pick up towards the end of January. And I think I want to say it was about January twenty fifth or twenty twenty fourth or something like that. Um, it really started to pick up, and then we had that big, huge, fat correction that started and a big spike in volatility in early February. But it had been brewing for a while, for a little while.
And so while many of us uh, worry about um, a correction and, and, and so forth, I think um, I can allay your, some of your fears. Don't worry about a correction here. Worry about probably more of a bear market. I don't think we're in that in that mode of, of, of getting ready for a bear market. I think earnings are, are, are still strong and stellar and have and will be for the next several uh, several months, probably two or three quarters down the road. Um, normal cycles are bull and bear. We have bull and bear market cycles. We haven't had a normal cycle here since 2009. Uh, we haven't had a, a bear market since 2009. That, that 2008, 2009 uh, bear market was pretty shallow. Um, but, you know, by and large, I think if you keep an open mind, you can make money in a bear market. Most people, most bulls and bears lose money in, in, in bear markets. So why is that? Because uh, the bulls are, are, are full, filled with hope on any market rally or any market move upwards. And the bears uh, continue to pound pound the markets down and often don't realize some of the best rallies and markets come during bear markets. Some of the most beautiful, strongest rallies we've seen over time, over history, Mark will, Mark will probably confirm this, have happened in bear markets. So what, what ends up happening is, that, is somebody who, who's got a bearish bias, a bearish bet, is going to see that thing and they're going to automatically think, oh, it's over. I better, I better pull back and maybe even possibly even put some bear, bullish trades on. And then all of a sudden, boom, they lower the boom on you and we, we move right back down again. It twists your mind like you wouldn't believe. So I would urge you, pay attention. Take a look at the, 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 the technicals. It's so important. Listen, don't listen to the pundits or the experts who don't really care about your account, what you're doing. Um, be a, take an objective point of view. Don't have any bias. And, and I think you're going to be fine. As far as interest rates are concerned, yes, interest rates are rising. We have a, a, much, a, a pretty much flat uh, curve. Um, I know Mark has talked about this quite extensively. A flat yield curve does not necessarily mean uh, a recession is coming. I agree with him. But higher rates is what the Fed has wanted all along, right? Go back three, four years ago when um, Janet Yellen, even Ben Bernanke, even before her, were complaining that we had deflation, right? And they had to keep buying bonds and keep the QE going, 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 going until we had some inflation. So now we have a little bit of inflation and people still aren't happy. It is what it is. So... So when, when stocks move up, for instance, like today, we had a big, huge reversal day today. What am I looking for? I'm looking for some confirmation. I want to see some confirmation. What is confirmation? Basically, it's a follow-through day. So tomorrow might be an important follow-through day. If we get a higher high and a higher low tomorrow, maybe even close at the highs of the session. That's what I want to see. That's confirmation. So, um, for instance, Tuesday's move. We saw Tuesday, we, we, we made a low at about 26, 25 or something like that on the S&P 500, and we rallied back sharply. And everybody seemed to believe, and I got some feedback on this, that, all right, game on. We put a nice hammer in there. It's a lower high, lower low than we had from Monday, but still, game on, we're moving up. And then what happened yesterday? Fail, right? Failure, because we didn't get any confirmation yesterday. So I know a lot of people are looking at today as a pretty powerful reversal. But if we don't have confirmation of it tomorrow, then we have we have some problems. Now, I think there's a better chance tomorrow of it happening, uh, depending on the jobs number, how people take the jobs number. I don't know if the jobs number per se is going to have any effect on market players. So in other words... We could have a bad number and the stock market could go up. We could have a good number, whatever that might be, and the stock market could go down. We could have a good number and the market could go up. We could have a bad number and the market could go down. So we have four different scenarios here, right? I hope I haven't ex made your head explode by all these different options over there. We have four different boxes, four different windows we could we could move in based on the information that's coming out tomorrow. Um, I would say possibly... Um, Especially uh, last month, we, we didn't have much of a, looking at April 1st, we didn't have much of our beginning of April, we didn't have much of a rally. We were kind of in a downtrend after that jobs report came out last time around. 
So we'll see what happens. Um, so, uh, again, we see, need some confirmation tomorrow. Can low volatility, like we have right now, we're currently in about a VIX of about 1590. We were up about 17 earlier today, and the and the VIX, the the VIX futures actually the VIX futures hit a peak of 18 today when the market was down over 300. So we got that down move early on and bounced off of it. Well, in previous times we'd have down moves and we'd just stay down, 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 down all day long. It was a trend day. And at one point in time, the ad, uh, ADSPD, which is the advanced decline um, uh, line was at minus uh, 395, which is a, a, a trend down day. So we, were, we reached that at, at a point when a concentrated amount of selling had taken place in the first hour, hour and a half of the day. We hit that um, 2591 level on the, on the futures, and the S&P 500 hit 2594, and that was enough to get people back involved. Um, so the question is, can low volatility be sustainable? Well, Look at 2017, right? We had low volatility practically for the whole entire year, right? And 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 that was pretty sustainable. Every every pop in volatility was sold, and of course that got people in trouble in 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 this last uh, drop in February when uh, when volatility spikes got everybody um, uh, washed out uh, who were short volatility. Sentiment indicators. Um, up to they were up to historically high when they're up to historically high levels like they were in 17 and volatility smashed below 13 percent and was holding on for months so yes the answer is the que to, to the question is yes volatility can be uh, sustained at low levels but it doesn't happen very often in fact it's pretty rare that uh, I don't think 2017 has ever happened before it can happen but probably not going to happen down the road into the future We'll see higher volatility, though, in bear market trends, right? And we, we could be in the middle of a bear market trend right now. I don't know. Um, uh, of course, uh, certainly if, um, if earnings don't come in uh, strong at, uh, to expectations for the rest of the year, we could very easily slip into a bear market trend uh, and uh, move quite substantially lower into the uh, 2400s, even 2200s of the S&P 500. Um, Higher volatility, though, tells us what? That option prices are, are elevated. People are buying protection. We saw some of that earlier today, and people took that protection off, and VIX fell sharply back under 16%. Market expects wide moves when volatility expands. We had a pretty, pretty wide move today because the VIX was up sharply. But truthfully, I think most traders, as I said earlier, bull and bear lose money in a bear market because of the expectations and the hope and the extreme levels of fear that are, are evident there. People should be buying um, when they're, when they're selling um, and people should be selling when they're actually buying. Some of the biggest and best rallies do occur in bear markets because people's psychology have flipped to the wrong side. Some of you might be familiar with this chart. Anybody? By the way, if you have any questions on anything that we're covering today, please go ahead and open up the chat windows box. I'm more than happy to answer those questions as we move along here. Options skewed. Anybody familiar with options skewed? Tail risk trades. Okay, tail risk trades are basically money that is bet on low probability but good return on on a particular trade on a low on a uh, on an event happening that is going to. Um, move the markets in a big way, usually to the downside. So when these levels hit um, uh, in the past couple of years, you can see the circles, little bubbles I have on the chart here. These are huge tail risk bets. And subsequently, the market fell sharply after we saw these big skew bets, maybe for a couple of weeks, maybe for like a month. But these are good indications. Currently right now, the skew is not very, very high right now. It really hasn't been um, uh, much of an effect, especially when volatility is really, really low. It just means that when the VIX is low, it's cheap to buy options, right? Very cheap to buy options to buy protection. So in 2018, we'll talk about volatility here in 2018. Is it the same old story? Um, well, here's a uh, updated chart. This was from uh, February, which saw the big or end of January or February. We saw the big spike in volatility here, and then we spiked even more. All right, and we've been coming down in volatility. In um, this was in 2017. Uh, 
weekly chart. Here's the weekly updated from that chart. So here, here we have it from 2015, 16, 17, and 16 and 17. That volatility trend is doing what? Starting to come down, right? So damping, dampening volatility. Are we going to get back into that range of 9, 10, 11% where people were really complacent? Highly unlikely. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I'm just going to say highly unlikely that's going to happen again. So is it the same old story? This is back in February 4th. I put this slide together. Um, it's only that we had only the second close under the 20-day moving average. I told everybody it was, a, it was a big warning flag. We had bought some puts on that Groundhog Day when the jobs report came out from January when it was showing a lot of um, – a bit of inflation on the wage front, and then we know what happened the following week. So here, here's a present day look at things, and of course uh, we're we're kind of we're a little bit lower now from when I printed this out from uh, April 27th, but still on the low end of this uh, uh, of this triangle here right now. The lower end of that triangle has really pushed up to about 26.25 or 26.30 which is where we're at right now. So really at the low end of that, of that range. So there is some upside. I mean, if you want um, to see, but there's some upside to be had to maybe around 20, um, 2700, but I think it's going to be difficult here in this market to get there, especially since we're not oversold. When we get to that really big oversold level, for instance, the McClellan oscillator is selling at around is, is, is peaking at around minus 250 or 280. We really get a good washout. We get a really big rally. I mean, today was a decent rally off of the low, but it went, we're not plus 30 handles at the end of the day. The S&P 500 actually closed down six. The futures were up four, but the S&P, but the difference be, being uh, uh, the fair value, right? So the S&P was actually down today. The Nasdaq was down 12. Of course, we again we were down a lot earlier, and the Dow was only up five. So we only all we did is recovered stuff from earlier today. Some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, this is the CNN Fear and Greed Index, right? So I took a reading here in February, and you can see where the, the Fear and Greed Index was at, reading at 40. This is a uh, combination of about seven indicators, which includes the put call ratio, the uh, uh, junk bond index, uh, the VIX, and a few other things. Um, so it was 40 back in February, right? See where we're at now. Look at that. We haven't really changed. In, uh, in, in a little over uh, three months, right? February, March, April, end up a little, little less than three months. We're still at 40. So what's changed, right? As far as psychology is concerned, not a whole lot, but the price action certainly has, right? Hey, Bob, just a little interjection here that okay. um, fear and greed index actually dropped to zero in uh, late February. Which did, I'm sorry? The fear and greed index actually dropped to zero, uh, was it, was it which made wow. which made the W bottom look a little more interesting. It's but it's now moved back up. But yeah, it's moved back up. I think we're we might be a little bit lower today. This was actually on April thirtieth, but uh, but yeah. So I mean that, that's that's a good reference point, Mark. Thank you for mentioning that because um, you know most most people want to get in when the fear is at maximum pain point. Um, they want to jump in there and, and and buy it, maybe buy it in for a trade. But you know, as a, as a as a you know as a trends are concerned, you know, we, we we have lower highs and higher lows. By definition, a trendless market, right? So um, higher yeah. lower highs and higher lows, right, Mark? Yeah, and what's interesting is the fear and greed index went to uh, I don't know ninety five in December. Ooh which caused people at Merrill Lynch to turn bearish. But of course, the market went up until January 29th. So you had about five weeks of huge upside, almost uh, 9% in the S&P, eight, probably 8.5% with the fear and greed index at 100. So you're absolutely right. You know, at the, at the extremes, you're just sort of catching a spear if you try and act on it. But when you get a retest or an ability to buy them cheap or sell them dear after You've reached a peak. That's when it gets interesting. You know, Mark. We, as I was mentioning, we we had we had added some puts on February second, which is Groundhog Day, which is the day that the uh, January uh, jobs report was uh, re was released, and that was the day. And and look, we we had, you know the day the, the Dow opened up down about 150 or 180, ended up down 500 that day, um, and we had added puts 
in the middle of the day, middle towards the end of the day. So the Dow was still, we were down 300, 350, maybe 400 when we were still adding puts. So I, I didn't particularly need to get in at the, at the tippy tippy top. Um, it was, it was pretty darn close, but I mean, we didn't really need to get in at the tippy tippy top. What we needed to do is, is identify the trend and at the, the, that was ready to turn and, and get in at an appropriate time when it was a little bit easier to get into. Now, did I know that we were going to go down 1100 the following Monday? Of course not. But, um, the odds seemed to favor that that was a good trade at the time. I wasn't looking for, you know, I actually, the Dow was down 1600 at that, at some point on that Monday. Right. And, uh, um, it just, at that time, you know, and again, this is uh, going back to the, this is the day right over here. And then we got in because February 2nd, you know, we, we ended up closing down at 2762. Of course, the next day was a, was a, a massive drop down the following Monday. But, um, you know, again, um, and I, and I think that, you know, some of the indicators that, um, that I was looking at with Chaken Analytics were also showing Mark that, that things were, were, were about ready to, to turn there, but I waited for a little bit of confirmation over there. Um, put call ratio. So this is another one of those sentiment indicators that I like to use that you, that I think all of you should be able to find useful. Um, the, uh, put call ratio tells us, uh, the amount of puts that are being bought versus calls historical, um, average on the put call ratio is about 61%, um, which means that more calls are being bought than, than puts, which kind of is uh, naturally speaking, because that, that makes sense because, the market trend over long term is what? It goes, it's up, right? The market rallies over the long term. So when we see uh, high readings in put call ratio, like for instance, today we saw 124% or 1.24 put call ratio when the markets were at their low. That seemed to be pretty, pretty much um, uh, for some in the short term, a washout for the markets that they thought it was time to step back in. And sure enough, we got a bit of a rally. And so how does the market, the S&P 500, a lot of people have asked me about this, you know, how did, Bob, how does the market react to VIX trends when the market, when the VIX is trending? Well, when the VIX is low, we see a contraction in, in the range, right, of the S&P 500. We saw a lot of that in 2017. And you can see the ranges here on this um, daily chart from 2014 and 15. When we had extreme volatility, high volatility, and I and I and I I want to I want to say to myself that in 2015, uh, I think Mark and I did a webinar here, and you can see this here. We might have been here that that he, he we talked about a, a, a W bottom here, um, and possibly could have been 16, Mark. That um, we called this one. Um, it was like the first webinar we did, and. Uh, um, my memory is fading a little bit for the dates, but I think it was pretty darn close that uh, you called this uh, the W bottom, and it, it was an absolute perfect, um, perfect shot. I think it might have been might have been 16 mark, but uh, but you can see the ranges expand here when volatility is up. Um, so going in, into 2018, I'm sorry, 2015. This is in September. We had a big, huge move in in August. Volatility expanded. Uh, in that month, you can see that. Look at that huge correction. That was in uh, in, in in about six or seven days. The S and P 500 fell from 2100 all the way down to 1870, more than 10 percent in about six sessions or something like that. Volatility expanded, and we see the ranges expanding. But prior to that, look how tight the ranges were. So I so I would argue um, current situation here. We have a top of 2878, which is the high back in January 29th, a low on February 9th of 2533. That's a range of about 245 points. The midpoint there is about 2753. And if you were going to put a gun to my head and say, Bob, is it a bull or a bear market? I would say yes. Is it a bull or a bear? I'd say yes. We're probably in some some stage of, of both right now maybe a late stage bull on an early early part bear market or something like that we see though around that midpoint of 2753 lots and lots of noise right I put a circle around that and you can see there's a lot of uh, a lot of noise around that area here that we need to be 
um, worried and concerned about. Okay, once we break through that 2750 area convincingly, and we have more um, new highs than new lows. We had that yesterday, actually, I'm not sure about today. More new highs, new, more than new lows. We said good breath, that sort of stuff. Um, put call ratios uh, getting lower. Those are the sort of things that are going to, um, those are the ingredients and also more uh, better on the money flow with the uh, chicken money flow and the power gauge ratings improving. We see all those things happening uh, in a positive fashion. Then we're going to see this, uh, this market start breaking up through that 2750 um, level. Hey, Bob, that your memory is pretty good. That webinar was March 15th of 2016. The, the S&P has rallied 22% since then. 22%. Fantastic. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, and, and, I, and I recall, Mark, I mean, listen, I, had egg, I, have egg, I always had, have had egg on my face because we discussed that. And I, you said I, it was a V, looked like a V bottom. And you had said, no, this is going to look more like a W. And we started coming back in, and we made that that uh, second bottom. I guess the W is the is a is a is a retest of that first bottom, and we bounced right off of that. And you said we're we're we're, we're gonna we're gonna bounce off of that layer, area, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take off. And as sure as as sure as day, you were absolutely correct. And uh, um, that was the, that was a fantastic call. Um. So going back um, to to this last slide, the so Vivix. Everybody familiar with the Vivix? V V I X, which is the, uh, um, it's called the. I call it volatility squared. This is the volatility of the volatility index. All right, it's been it's been pretty low now. It, you see when on these big spikes over here, they tend to be exhaustion moves to the upside. When the volatility of volatility is is um, spiking like this, like we see on the chart here. That tends to be some good exhaustion in the markets, and that tends to be that um, the sellers are probably about done. Um, currently, right now, look at where we're at. This is from April 27th. Volatility is low. So it means that the VIX has not been moving too much, too aggressively here. And we see the volatility index continues to stay muted here. Eventually, I think we're going to see the VIX start picking it up. but Currently, right now, that isn't the case. So getting long volatility, getting short volatility has been a losing trade. So what do we do? Well, certainly don't panic. Uh, Jim Cramer says nobody ever made a dime panicking, and I, I totally agree with that. Um, we got to wait for things to settle down. Slow down a little bit. Don't trade all the time. And understand that the longer-term trend – whether it's two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, is, is probably up, higher. Okay, I'm willing to go out on a limb, put my neck on the line and say that over the long term, the markets are going to go up because that's just what we've, what we've had here in the United States. And we have the, it's the greatest country in the world. Um, we produce the, the, the best stuff and everybody wants what we have in the United States. Um, and we, we can demand a premium. And that premium ends up coming in back into our, our pockets um, as shareholders of stocks. Dip buyers do come in from time to time. We see them pretty active. So what? They disappear from time to time as well, too. We just have to be cognizant and recognize when the conditions change, we have to change with them. Everybody understand that? So I would say, is this the same market? Um, I always look at the monthly um, uh, S&P 500 index to kind of give myself a, a clue or an idea of where the longer term trend lies. Um, we made a lower high and a lower low for the uh, third straight month, February, March, and April. Um, we barely escaped here with an up month in April, but you can see, look at that MACD is starting to cross over. Now, the last time it crossed over, it was a precursor to a pretty nasty correction, 15 into 16, and um, uh, that what, what Mark was referencing back in uh, in March of 2016. Um, we do have uh, the Williams percent R is about is broken underneath for the first time since 2016 under the 80 level. So is, there's 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 warning flags out there. Okay, so we have to be careful. We have to be cognizant of that. A trend could be changing here on a longer term basis. 
And there we go, change in character. I don't think we have it right now, but just in case, um, uh, you have to understand that markets don't go up forever. And if you believe that, you live in some sort of fantasy world, um, and you're probably going to lose all your money if you're in the market. So I, I'd be careful. So some notable changes that we've that we've we've had here. The Fed may consider raising rates faster if inflation starts ratcheting up. I looked at the uh, Fed um, Fed fund futures here. Of course, you know yesterday the Fed met. Uh, for their May meeting, they didn't do anything other than just give out a statement. Um, uh, it, it appears in Fed Fund's futures currently right now that there's about a, a 95% chance, baked, or 98% chance baked in of a rate hike in June in about six weeks. Um, nothing in July and then or August, and then the next one would be in September. It's about 97% chance for September. So two more rate hikes pretty much baked in. But if you go all the way out to December, Mark, I think you might find this interesting, is that there's about a 44% chance of a, another rate hike, a fourth one for 2018, and actually about a 5.5% chance of a fifth rate hike. I think that would probably be devastating for the markets, but obviously if the Fed is intent on doing that, there's got to be some inflation there, and we might see quite a bit lower prices in, um, in equity, uh, equity markets and bond prices are probably going to, um, uh, get, get pasted as well too. So I thought that'd be fun, kind of interesting. Um, just a couple more slides over here. Uh, the king of all charts, this is the one that we take a look at a lot. My friend, Stephen, um, Stephen place puts this one together. Uh, the VIX over the VXV is an interesting one. The VIX, so this is a 30 day index of volatility. The VXV is 90 days. Okay, so uh, 30 day over 90 day. When it's over one, it's pretty much oversold. The market's oversold. It's overbought on the volatility index. And we tend to look for big reversals in the markets. We're not quite there yet. Here's some learning tools that, uh, that I like to use that I'm going to share with you as well. These slides are going to be available for you as well. Um, if you email me at bob at explosiveoptions.net. Um, a little bit more about what I do here. Um, I'm very excited about um, this. Uh, everybody can see that. That's the book cover of my new book, which Mark actually uh, wrote the foreword to. Um, I know he's been wondering when we're going to get this thing released. I think we have it slated for June. I'm really excited about that. This is a book that I spent um, a good portion of uh, 2014 and 15 writing, and we have it ready to ready to go and have it in your hands um, very very soon. Uh, it's a lot of work about uh, a lot of stuff about options and technical analysis and risk management and that sort of stuff. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm thankful that Mark uh, was able to write the forward. Jim Kramer actually wrote a, uh, uh, a comment for us as well, too. And you can see that's on the uh, front page of the, uh, of the book. Um, so explosiveoptions.net, I'm going to, uh, to show you this is the website that we have. Um, we have a pro room as well, too, a uh, chat room. Uh, we have some, some unbelievable uh, traders that are in our room on a regular basis. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you, send you guys a great offer over here. This is normally um, not reserved for anybody, but um, but because all of you are, are with uh, are with Mark, and Mark is such a great friend of mine, and um, uh, love him very much, and, and and everybody over at Chicken Analytics, um, we're going to give all of you guys a chance to to get involved with. Um, explosive options today. And this is just an offer for everybody uh, who is here on the webinar. It's going to last for about uh, three or four days only. Six months of the options, uh, explosive options uh, service, the chat room and spread trader, which is up about 23% year to date, 2018, um, for $9.99 for six months. All right. An annual subscription runs about $2,700. Uh, for six months, this normally runs about uh, $1,349, so you're saving $350 off of this for this offer. It's a, it's a very generous offer for all of you. And you can see the website, uh, uh, the, the web link down below is explosiveoptions.net slash um, webinar offer, webinar dash offer. Um, and you can also get this to, um, you can also email me as well too, and I could send this uh, link to you. Um, if, you, uh, if you can't get to it. Um, but I'm also going to give you guys a special offer as well, too, that if you purchase that today, I will put your name down and send you a signed copy of the book. 
when it's released, again, likely in June. So you'll, you'll, you'll not only have the services ready to go, all three of them, we have a, a great room uh, that we've used, Slack.com. We started with that about a month or so ago. It's really fantastic. Many of you guys are, are uh, familiar with Slack. Um, we have a great uh, trading room there. You have access to that, the spread trader, and also the explosive options service that I manage on a regular basis on a uh, daily. And then, of course, you're going to get an autographed copy of my book. So explosiveoptions.net slash webinar dash offer uh, with, a, with a, a slash in there as well, too. Gets you to the sign-up page. It's working fine. I checked it earlier. And um, and then you'll get the copy of the book. So any questions from you um, at all or anything from, uh, from Mark? I'll go ahead and put the link up as well, too. Yeah, Bob, let me jump in here because um, you and I have been at this for, uh, I guess, three years now. And every time I'm on one of Bob's webinars, because I like to stay on till the end, I learn something. And I did today with regard to those volatility indicators that I don't usually follow. This is a, you know, a great opportunity to uh, look at the markets through the eyes of someone who's a real pro. And you know, Jim Cramer, I don't think Bob told you this, but Bob invented the whole fang concept and um, sold the idea to jim kramer who obviously has the big stage to get it out there but, but bob is just a visionary he really uh, but he's a visionary who really likes to trade um, there are a lot of people out there myself included because i'm running a big company with almost 30 people i, I can't trade every day my wife does bob bob knows how good sandy is he's awesome but with bob's stuff you're basically seeing the trades as they're happening there's some really big winners so obviously a few losers thrown in but i really believe in bob otherwise he wouldn't be invited back time and again to continue to present to the chaken community so i just like to thank you bob for all the people who've been on with you and have become your subscribers and uh for a really good friendship thank you so much mark i really do appreciate that and uh you know, it's um, uh, it's been a uh, it's it's been a great friendship with between you and I, and um, I, I really I really look forward to uh, to uh, sharing some of the stuff that we have with the with with your community as well too. And um, and again, this is a uh, this is just a special offer for all of you guys. You can see it down over here. Um, uh, thanks for attending the, the webinar. Um, and this uh, special is is only on for you guys uh, for six months. Save me three hundred fifty bucks and. Um, uh, again, you'll you get a copy of the book as well, too, uh, when it's ready to come out in June. And uh, listen, you know what? Um, for $9.99, uh, that will, I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain that the ideas that you get from the, from the chat room, okay, will more than pay for that in, in like a month or two. I mean, if you do a couple of trades... From, from some of the ideas that I put out there or that David puts out there or some of the other in the room, uh, that'll be, that'll be paid. For. You, you'll have that more than paid for. Have, we've had some people in here who have been here and you can see Tim, he, his, his quote right here in one year, I achieved hundred percent return on my options trading account. And he has a good size account as well too. This has been done without any flashy or risky trades. I made more conservative trades as you're always preaching, taking profits, limiting losses, properly sizing my trades. Look at that, everybody. This is what we preach every single day. I can't, I can't tell you how much I, I was really grateful for him to, to, to make that comment over here because it's so important. It's not being irresponsible. I know Mark talks about this a lot, how important it is to be a responsible trader. You don't go out and be reckless, okay? He, he said, thank you for providing the environment and opportunity for myself and others to learn and grow as traders. I take a lot of pride in that. As, as, as everybody else in our room does as well. It's, it's a pride issue. It's what we, what we do. We have a passion for teaching, for helping you become better, for helping you grow. And that's what it's all about, whether it's the EO service, whether it's the chat room, or whether it's our spread trader. It's, it, it, it's all of it combined. Um, we do these webinars. We don't charge anything for these webinars. We just want to help teach you guys things about what, what we're doing and how we're doing it. So I, I, I would urge you all of you guys to take advantage of the offer here because it's only it's not going to be there for much more than a few more days. Um, and hopefully you guys will get a chance to, uh, to see what we're all about in the chat room uh, starting tomorrow. I'll be in the, I'll be, again, I'll be in the air tomorrow. 
uh, tonight. I'll be in the chat room actually tomorrow because I'll be at the uh, Mark the Crazy. I'll be at the uh, I'll, I'll be flying in at seven o'clock, taking a car over there to the street, and then opening up my uh, my laptop, and I'll be in the chat room on on like probably two hours of sleep. <laughs> but you know, it's what you, it's what you do, right? When people are are, are waiting for you, They're, they need you. You got to do it, right? So um, anyway, thanks again, Mark. I really appreciate you um, uh, being with us today. And uh, are you there? there you are. Yeah, safe journey, uh, Bob. Thanks very much, Mark. And everybody else, have a great day and have a great afternoon. And uh, I look forward to seeing all of you guys in the chat room if you sign up. And uh, if you guys want to uh, need a copy of the, of the webinar, it'll be up on the website a little bit later on today. If you need a copy of the slides, shoot, shoot me an email at bob at explosiveoptions.net. And again, to uh, to sign up for um, for the service, go to this website, explosiveoptions.net slash webinar dash offer with a slash on it. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate you guys all being here. Have a wonderful day. And uh, thank you again. And um, have a good weekend uh, to all of you. And I'll see you guys all next week. Take care. Bye-bye.